Hi, welcome to TechCrunch TV. I'm Sarah Lacey. I'm here with Encore Jane, the head of the Cairo Society. In 30 seconds, tell us what the Cairo Society does. So the Cairo Society is looking at how the next generation of entrepreneurs can create high growth companies that take on some of the world's biggest problems. Very well done. You have a lot of practice <laughs> in this. You, your elevator pitch is pitch perfect. Fantastic. So uh, your sort of claim to fame in the last week or so is that you're working with President Obama's um, Startup America initiative. Right. Uh, we wrote about this on TechCrunch, so I'm going to assume that our, our readers know a bit about it. Right. Um, some of the pillars are access to capital, access to, right. to mentorship, more funded R&D that can be taken into the private sector, and sure. partnerships between, uh, between public and private. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, I think generally we're very, very cynical right. that any government program can actually develop entrepreneurship. I meet with right. hundreds of entrepreneurs, you know, every week. I've never heard one say, I'm doing this because Can't wait of for the government, government to program. get involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a really important point. I mean, <clears throat> the entrepreneurship, as I think you and I can both agree, is the most important core part of American culture. I mean, since the beginning of the United States, we've been built by entrepreneurs, whether immigrants or local, coming in to create you know, the American dream. And I think with the whole Wall Street crisis, we kind of lost that spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship. And so what's really important here is not to say that the government is stepping in and implementing all these policies. I mean, that's, that will help on an economic standpoint to, you know, to a certain extent. But what's really important is that we're refocusing the private effort and re really refocusing all the young people across the country to say, this is our chance to reinvent, re-pursue the American dream. Mm -hmm. We've lost that. Uh, and so if we can get, use something like the government, the White House as a platform for bringing all the private sector together and say, look, the entrepreneur is the celebrity. The entrepreneur is the rock star. I mean, Obama talked about this being the Sputnik moment in his uh, State of the Union. I think it's the Sputnik moment more than just the fact that we're going to invest capital in, re in technology or innovation, right? Mm -hmm. What was so magical about that time was that we had an entire generation of people suddenly inspired. The space literally was the, the right. limit. You could go to the moon, we could go to the edge of the universe. People wanted to be astronauts, wanted to be entrepreneurs, right. scientists. And nowadays it's always, how can I get a corporate job at Goldman Sachs? But see, I'm surprised that you say that because that's definitely not what we see here. I mean, we see kids carried away by Mark Zuckerberg and everyone is moving right. here. And it's actually, to me, it's an extreme of the other side where people, this glamorized version of you know, what Facebook was, which has you know, been completely bastardized right. in popular culture. <laughs> I mean, as it was with Google, as it was right. you know, with, with Microsoft and, and all these cases, you know, no one sees the struggle that goes into these companies. And sure. I feel like we get college kids coming out here every day who, are, who you know, wear flip-flops and are like, oh, I'm going to build a billion-dollar company, and it's like, you're going to get eaten alive. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I don't know. It, you know, it doesn't seem to me there's a real problem with, with entrepreneurship being celebrity. But so you got to hang out in Silicon Valley every day. I, I go to school in Philadelphia and, you know, hang out in New York and D.C. where it's a very different culture. Mm -hmm. And so if we could create that Silicon Valley culture across the United States and, frankly, across the world, I mean, progress would be unbelievable. That's what makes this place so magical, is that mm -hmm. everybody thinks they can do it. What I'd like to throw out there, and one thing I think we talk about with you know, Startup America a little bit, is it's not just about the Web 2.0 startups. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the meaningful businesses that are going to drive GDP growth, job growth, and create wealth are the companies that are taking on some of the big problems in the world. You know, not from a social entrepreneurship perspective, right. but really saying the next billion dollar companies will be in redefining how we take on education. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a fundamental problem in the way we teach kids. I mean, mm -hmm. the textbook, lecture hall, it's from the, I mean, we've done that for thousands of years. Right. You know, nowadays kids have cell phones and Game Boys and video games, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't we create private companies that create engaging simulations for young kids to learn in an exciting, addictive way? Mm -hmm. And if you can accomplish that, you will make lots of money. Right. Um, and I think there's a, there's a fundamental issue where while the entrepreneur culture has been, you know, kind of popularized by things like the social network and Facebook and these different popular culture items, it's still not showing, like you said, A, the tough life that goes into it. I mean, it's not behind every overnight not success. Glamorous. There's years <laughs> yeah. and years and years of staying up 24 hours a day to make uh -huh. something happen. But at the same time, it's a lot of superficial companies. Right. And if we can create meaningful companies that solve problems, I mean, look at the big Fortune 500 companies today, mm -hmm. right? More than half of them were started during a recession, and more than half of them were started by saying there's a fundamental right. need in X industry or Y industry. Right. Let's create a new innovative solution. No, I, I totally agree with you there. I mean, two things that I've written about a lot um, that frustrate me about Silicon Valley. I think we're at a real crossroads, even as you know, right. Silicon Valley is sort of. Um, 
you know, emblematic of this this movement for the rest of America. I think right. the problems here are, you know, we're 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 really getting away from the roots of technology and science. Right. I mean, most of the companies um, that we fetishize that become very big um, are really more media and entertainment companies yeah. than anything, which is fine. But you know, we're not really solving huge problems. And there's Agreed. a lot of Agreed. huge problems. And this is one reason I spent the last two years traveling in the emerging right. world because I think when you, I think part of the problem is Americans don't live with those problems. And yeah. Silicon Valley tends to ignore the poor and the <laughs> digital divide in our own country. Yes. And I think when, you know, you're in India and two thirds of the country lives in villages that don't even have electricity, you can't avoid those problems. You Absolutely. have to solve them. Um, but I mean, that's a big cultural shift in America for people right. to really want to solve things like lack of water, serious problems with education. Um, so I don't know if it's as big of a cultural shift as you think. Um, there's definitely a, a huge gap between what we're seeing here and what we're seeing in India, like we talked about earlier. But there is an interesting kind of movement and excitement amongst these college graduates of wanting to change the world. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same, like, let's change the world that you saw in the 60s or 70s where, you know, it is what it is. It's really, let's go do something about You're it. You're saying less drugs. <laughs> something, like, something like that. Uh, and so it's really, let's go out and do something about mm -hmm. it. And it's not about sitting here and waiting for somebody else, like the government, to implement new policy. It's saying, hey, I can get this done, and I can make a ton of money doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's cool is you got, because of that culture, you're getting young people connecting now from all over. They're talking about these issues, and they're saying there's opportunities here and right. here and here, which didn't happen before. So you know, I'm not saying that kids today in America are going to go out and say, how can I bring clean water to a village in southern India? Right. right? But there are just as many fundamental problems in America in feels like clean tech even. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can build a better solar panel or portable energy that yeah. you know, No, in there's a van. unbanked people here. It's there's people unbelievable. Without internet <laughs> you, know? here. you don't have to go too I mean, far. Especially internet's a big thing. And you know, I'm working with a company right now that's trying to build out high speed wireless internet across rural America. I mean, mm -hmm. people today in rural America don't have access to broadband internet. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and we completely forget about that in Silicon Valley in New York and mm -hmm. you know that's a billion dollar business right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in all the things that the government's talking about doing with Startup America, I mean, it seems to me one of the most impactful is really spending on real, you know, capital R, R&D. Right. You know, R&D has really gotten a little bit bastardized as a term, I think, in the last decade or so. Yeah. You know, all, there, there just isn't the same amount of fundamental science research being done. It's not the place for venture capital to do it. Sure. And it's not the place for big corporations to do it either. Sure. And so as much as everyone talks about more spending on R&D, it's really more incremental. Um, but you know, one thing that seemed really, really missing from this, uh, when it talked about removing barriers, where's a startup visa? So this is actually this, this is one of the things that we've been talking about a lot, and I'm, I'm really hoping this gets pushed through soon. I know it is a top priority of a lot of these people involved with Startup America on both the private sector and public side. I mean, side. It's, it's beyond a top priority. If you go through Silicon I, Valley, I could take you upstairs to any of the companies. I could take you on the peninsula. I could take you to Google and Facebook. If you asked anyone, yeah. what is your single biggest problem? They say the Startup Visa. They're getting, it's, it's hiring. We cannot, I mean, there are not enough people to hire. And being a college student, I can tell you, and dealing with some of the college students in the Cairo Society, it's so frustrating because we have the top students coming in from around the world at these top institutions like Harvard and MIT and Stanford. Mm -hmm. We train them, we get them involved, and they say, I'd love to sit here and start a company. And they can't. So they have to go to a job at a big company that will sponsor a visa for them or they have to go home, mm -hmm. which is shocking to me. And I'm really hoping that gets fixed as soon as possible. And there's caps on visas, so that's it's, not even open to everyone. It's, it's shocking. I mean, honestly, the America was built on immigrants. We were built on entrepreneurs. We were built on innovators. And right. we need to bring back that culture, which I'm hoping will be a part of this. But I mean, that's the single biggest threat. Why isn't a part of it now? So par that's part of what we're trying to do now. So we just launched a big partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And these guys have traditionally represented you know, small business and big business. We're now adding in that third element. So as part of this partnership, we're creating the first voice for entrepreneurs in DC. I mean, Chamber of Commerce has significant influence, significant uh, you know, reach. And if we can get young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from around the country to have somebody in DC all the time representing them, I think we may actually get these issues that we talk about in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. out in front of lawmakers right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, no one here likes to waste their time on Capitol Hill dealing with congressmen. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so this could be a pretty interesting opportunity.